Joining us right now to talk about the divide in Washington over the Build Back Better bill, Pennsylvania Senator Pat Toomey. He's the lead Republican on the Senate Banking Committee. He also serves on the Finance and the Budget Committees. And, um, Senator, it looks like this vote will be taken this morning and very likely will pass in the House. Then it moves to the Senate. And I guess the question is, what happens there? Yeah, that's always been the question, Becky. Um, this is... Uh, doesn't really tell us all that much, not much that we didn't already know. I guess it does tell us that the so-called moderate Democrats really don't care about the deficit, um, that uh, what really matters to many of them is making sure that they have this big tax cut for very wealthy constituents in high tax jurisdictions. They, they get those things. Um, and uh, there's just so much fiction in here. You, look, Senator Manchin's exactly right. The most sensible thing, I mean, not that our Democratic colleagues were taking advice from me, but the most sensible thing for them to do would be push this off to the spring. Let's see what inflation looks like. Does this continue to spiral uh, badly as it is now? Do they really want to spend this kind of money? It's going to get determined in the Senate, and then I think the House will pass whatever the Senate produces, if the Senate produces anything. Um, we well, I guess there's really one person to talk to. Uh and that would be Senator Joe Manchin. He may be the well, only person who can answer all of this. So it sounds like yeah, Kirsten Cinema has come a long way and, and has been satisfied by what she's seen. I, I, I think that Kirsten Cinema still has some reservations. I think Joe Manchin has major reservations. And I don't know how many Democrats are just keeping a lower profile, but also really worry about what, what they're about to do. Look, I mean, it's, this is radical stuff. Let's be honest. This is transformative which by design. It's intended to be. And that is just wildly out of step with the Democrats' majority. They didn't get a mandate to transform America. Joe Biden's mandate was to return to normal, right? And, and to be a reasonable person and to bring both sides together. And then he has governed from the very far radical left. And this bill is part of it. You know, the Wharton School says this is Four point six trillion dollars of spending, and it's all about, not all, but mostly about expanding the welfare state to the middle class. They've got all kinds of new programs. Some don't even have any income limitation, and those that do, it's extremely high. And you know, this kind of total transformation of the relationship between middle income Americans and the federal government, that is not what people were voting on last election. Well, Pat, the, let's be clear. They don't, they don't care what you think. You're, you're not going to give them a vote no matter what. But let's talk no, about what uh, Joe absolutely. Manchin and Kirsten Sinema yeah. and others may want. Uh, Joe Manchin has made it pretty clear that he doesn't like the game playing that he thinks is taking place with some of these numbers, doesn't like the way uh, they've cut the length of some of these programs and plan on spending it out further. Yeah. I, I guess what my question is, what do you think would satisfy some of those Democrats who have kind of raised their voice and said, hold off? Or, or do you think there's no satisfying somebody like Joe Manchin that he just wants to wait and see so before I, he makes any decision? I'm not sure. It's pretty clear from what he has said that that's his preference, that he would rather just put this all on hold and wait and see where we are in the spring. I, if he sticks to that, then they're going to put it on hold because they won't have the votes to pass it. He's also expressed real concern about the gimmicks, as you point out. You know, I, I'll give you one example. The CBO score is about $1.7 trillion. The child tax credit in the first year alone is $185 billion. And then they pretend that's going to go away when they have every intention of making it permanent. So, you know, that's the difference between the CBO's 1.7 score and Wharton's 4.6 score. Wharton scores it as it's intended to be, which is permanent programs. So Senator Manchin has said this is a complete gimmick to pretend this is all going to be just one year and disappear. And, uh, you know, if he drills down on that and, and forces some real accountability there, they'd have to scale it back dramatically. Um, but, you know, I, I can't be sure exactly what's going on inside his head. So what, what, what do you and the rest of your party do in the meantime? I, look, our obligation is to make clear our reasons for opposing this and make it clear to the American people. Um, I think we've been having this debate for months now. I think it, it played some role in the backdrop of elections just a few weeks ago in Virginia and New Jersey. And we saw uh, that uh, the American people are not on board on this. And we're going to continue to drive the message of how damaging this would be, how much this would cost, how much it would add to inflation, to our deficits, the tax increase. And uh, this is this is part of the political process. Have this debate. You know, Senator, the, the House has always been the more rough and tumble place where, where people um, 
you know, really take opposite sides, maybe get into a sort of theoretical battle a little bit more. But the Senate's always been seen as the calmer place. Is that still the case today, or has there been so much of a divide in this country that it's, you know, inevitably affected the Senate as well? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I'd exactly uh, agree with that characterization, although although I, I think it's true that the House historically is a little bit, maybe a little more volatile, maybe a little quicker to action. That still remains the case. Um, in the Senate, um, there are very strong opinions on both sides uh, on this bill, and then you got just a very, very small number of Democrats kind of, kind of in the middle, or at least on the right side of the Democratic spectrum, who have serious heartburn as well. So we'll see how it plays out. S Senator, uh, the, the nominee, president's nominee for control of the currency, uh, uh, the first name is it Sale? Sale. 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 Um, yeah. Professor Omarova, got it. Uh, right. some tough questioning from you, but also from Senator Tester uh, and, and others. Right. Um, we have the possibility of a decision on Fed chair between now right. and Thanksgiving, too. Do you think, do you, I mean, is there any reason to think if, if the president listened to Senators Warren and, and Sanders or whomever, I don't know where, where we really, I, I guess Professor Omarova was actually in the Bush administration, and they point that out. But do you think that her nomination is an indication that, that maybe uh, the president is going to move left, if you consider Lyle Brainerd, Brainerd uh, left of, of Jay Powell? Well, uh, Leo Brandon certainly is left of Jay Powell. Um, I, I, I don't want to speculate, Joe, about what the nomination of Saleh Omarova tells us about where they would go somewhere else. I will say it is shocking to me that any administration would nominate someone who, let's be honest, her policy positions are socialist positions. She has advocated for the abolition of banking and have the Fed replace all retail banking. She's advocated for price controls across the economy established by the Fed. Uh, she's advocated for all kinds of policies that, that she's advocated that the Fed directly allocate credit throughout the economy, not private banks. She's, she's carried on about how badly the private players allocate capital and resources and why the federal government has to replace that and needs to play an activist role on the part of regulators. And here she's nominated to be the top regulator of America's banks. It's, it's just shocking. Senator, I, I'm curious, what do you think of her views about crypto? Crypto. The reason I, I ask is you have a lot of banks who've obviously been, um, let's say, late to the game, um, pushing back against it. And so here's a person who you would think actually would be embracing crypto as something that would upend the banking system if, you, if that's her view. But she seems to have a very negative view. Well, uh, so it's, uh, it's not clear in some respects. Uh, I, I have questions about what her views are on crypto, but what I think you can reasonably infer is that she would be supportive of a digital dollar provided that it is controlled by the Fed. Everybody has their digital dollar account with the Fed. The Fed would have complete power to pay interest, including negative interest rates on your accounts, like confiscate some of your money as a, as a routine exercise in inflation control. Um, I, I think that element of the crypto spectrum she'd be okay with. Private crypto projects, I think she would be very skeptical of. Like you're, you're also skeptical of the, that first part? So I think you can make a strong case for a digital dollar, but not retail accounts, right? The Fed should not be the retail bank for Americans. Um, having a wholesale accounts, using a... Um, a digitized dollar, a representation of the dollar that would allow peer-to-peer -peer transfers, that would allow building on the platform and, and innovation from right. uh, app developers. I'm open to that. Okay. Senator, uh, great to see you. We always appreciate it. Uh, we can always have smart, intelligent conversations about even things like crypto with you, and we appreciate well, that. So thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thanks for having me.